I'm, I'm waiting because there's five seconds left until it officially starts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Rikke and I'm an artist and that's pretty much the only thing I'm sure of in my life. I am very multidisciplinary. Uh, my background is in art and game development. So uh, I want to know how many here has a background in game development or is doing it. Please raise your hand. <gasps> yes, there is some. Uh, how many is in uh, VR, XR, AR? Please raise your hand. There is nobody. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you about it. It's pretty cool. Okay, so... Okay, this is, uh, this is me. And those are the six hats I'm wearing at the moment. And I can already hear your minds going, oh, that's too much. I know. I know. Uh, so uh, since there were a few people here with a game, game development background, I think I should maybe explain some of this stuff. Uh, when we do a 3D game development pipeline, we usually start with concept art, which is up here. Um, we make a 2D concept, some drawings, and we do the whole creative process about what we want to make. And then the 3D artist, that's also me in this case, uh, start making the 3D model. And that's usually done in the in a triple A game sphere, which is like the high end super realistic ones. You do a process called sculpting, which means that you will act like it's clay basically. And then you will later bake that down. We use lots of fun terminology in games. We'll bake that down to um a game ready model that the game engine can process uh, in a suitable manner, which is everything from 60 frames per second to 90 frames per second, depending on whether you have a screen or uh, goggles on your face. Um, and uh, somewhere along the line, we need to figure out how the game character is going to be displayed. And that's usually done with something we call shaders, which is what the technical artists do. That's code. They write the math that makes the light hit the face and the face looks good. <laughs> I could explain more, but I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. I know all of these things uh, okay. Um, during the last two or three years, I've also gotten heavily into VR because it's super cool. So I'm now also a VR designer. You can't see this, but it's a really spooky picture. And a prototyper. Um, and the prototyping one is really interesting because I started my career in games as a 2D artist. And I thought programming was really scary. And a prototyper almost only does the programming. They will do the first game prototype um, and hand it over to someone who actually knows how to do the stuff. <laughs> um, but my last actual office job was a prototyper that involved almost no art at all. So that's where I am 12 years later. So uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I even manage <laughs> to have all these hats on my head. And I will tell you my, my secrets, which, you know, oh, that was the wrong one. There. They aren't really secrets. I'm pretty sure you've, you've seen this one before. But I think it's important to hear this one again. Um, if anyone wants to raise their hand about having a weird relationship with fear, fear of learning new things, fear of your job, fear of being a woman in tech. I mean, I've been through, I've been through all of them, and I have a couple of stories that I would like to share with you about that. Um, the first one happened when I was on uh, IRC, back when I was 15 years old, and the boys had decided that since I liked anime, I also needed to learn how to program. So they decided I had to learn Java. And after doing my first Hello World, they told me to code the Fibonacci sequence. And I was 15 years old, and I'm thinking back now, like I should have been able to do it. But after an evening of trying, I just gave up. It scared me. I was afraid of the programming because that was the thing I didn't, it was alien to me. I had a talent in art and programming was spooky. So I gave it way too easily. And that one instance, it birthed the fear in me that lasts for many years. And uh, I could have learned so much in that time. It's very sad. Uh, and then I got my first games job at the Raven Studio. And there's actually two female bosses there, Stina and Tinka, and they're super great. And they gave me a sense of security. So I never had to go through that whole anxiety process of being a woman in tech on the first job and not knowing kind of what's going on. 
I had those two there that could kind of take care of me, and that was really nice. Um, this was also back when we didn't use um, commercial games engines, and since most of you aren't from games, I will tell you about them. The illustration image here is a comparison image between Unity and Unreal. Those are the two main game engines we use. They're basically really good software that we use for game making. They didn't always used to be popular. Uh, right now, it's really easy to make games. You can try it when you get home, if you want to, because <laughs> it's it's just really nice. It's The UX is great, and um, the documentation is amazing, and the community is also really helpful. So, But back then, 12 years ago, we didn't have that. At Drum Studio, they had made their own engine, uh, two programmers, I think. Um, and if you hit the Help button, you got a random polka video from YouTube. Uh, if there was any documentation, I wasn't equipped to read it at my junior level. Uh, <laughs> at one point, I asked if we could have fog in the 3D level, and um, the answer was that the lead programmer printed out a huge uh, paper from SIGGRAPH. SIGGRAPH is like a very high-end conference for computer graphics, and gave that to me and said, P take your pick. <laughs> and of course, I... Um, I couldn't read it, I didn't understand anything, but that actually birthed a little fight in me. Like, I wanted to learn and understand this. I wanted to learn and understand the entire process so that I could make the right decisions. So um, after having worked there for just about four years, um, I set out on my own because I was tired of going to Drummond every day. <laughs> that, that, was, that was mostly it. So, um, And that was about the time when Unreal and Unity became the main games engines that everybody started using. And I noticed that my fear was gone. That that proprietary engine was a, a trial by fire. <laughs> if I could understand that, I could understand anything. So uh, that's when my fear left me. And after that, I haven't been afraid of learning anything. So that was cool. So my, my second secret is uh, how do I manage all the six hats at the same time? Because it's a lot. Um, those of you who have experienced having two, um, two jobs during one day will know how tiring it is. If you have to switch your role in the middle of a day, I had to do that plenty of times. And it always made me extra tired. So I devised a way of managing that because I love my job and I'm gonna keep making art when I go home. By the way, all of these images, uh, some of them are work images and some of them are play images and can't tell which one is which. So that's how similar my hobby and my, and my day job is. Um, and what I ended up doing was I called one of them working and one of them crafting. Basically, if someone's paying me to do it, it's work. If I do it, otherwise, it's crafting. And it's helped so much. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of a therapy um, method called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's used in psychology to treat depression and stuff. And uh, the point is that you're talking yourself into changing your own behavior. And that's basically what I'm doing with working and crafting. It's just a word, but it makes a ton of difference. So I feel so much better when I'm crafting because it doesn't feel like I'm at work, even though I do the same task. I've tricked my brain. So that's how you solve work-life balance, guys. That's all. That <laughs> <laughs> um, secret number three is that you can't wear six hats without uh, having get any help. So, um, but the, the, the good part about being so multidisciplinary is that you know very well that you're not the best at any of the things that you do, but you do know when you need to call the cavalry. You do know when you need to call the people who are the experts and, and where to get that help, because you usually know people from all over the spectrum. So there's a nice little quote from me back then. <laughs> Bleh, I misunderstood completely, and then uh, later makes more sense now, thanks. That's, <laughs> that's a very common um, back and forth between uh, me and a friend. Um, I ask him programming questions, he asks me uh, art questions, because we are the opposites. I am a technical artist, and he is a artistic technician, that's what he calls himself. Um, and also, um, <laughs> speaking of, uh, of coding things, uh, this one up here is actually my first attempt at procedurally generating a mesh, which means I'm actually plotting the triangles onto the screen in 3D space, which is something that the engines and the 3D software usually does for me. So I've actually been in the industry for 12 years without having to do that by <laughs> on my own yet. But that's where I needed to call the cavalry, because there was a lot of math 
and I'm not that good a programmer. So I had my buddy hold my hand and it worked much better than and I did that whole progression. It was uh, basically a day. It would probably take me three days if I didn't call for help. So and the other stuff is also technical art things. So, OK, I have nine minutes left. Let's talk about VR. Yeah. All right. Um, so now you know a little bit about my background and how I do all the things. I don't feel like I need to explain like the details of what all the things are other than what I already said. So um, about two years ago, I found social VR. And social VR, when it looks like this, is called VR chat. Has anyone heard of VR chat? Yeah, there is a government. OK, VR chat is uh, known to be a place filled with memes and teenage boys yelling loudly and just rowdiness. It's internet at its worst personified in virtual reality as anime girls. If you look up, if you look it up at you on YouTube. So um, and it is that it absolutely is that if you just log on and try you, that's what you'll find. But what it also is, is a really good SDK for the Unity engine to make your own VR content. and. This is my own tropical island that I like. I made it in December because it was cold and I wanted to feel warmer, so <laughs> I, I made my own tropical island. And I designed this based on a feeling I had when I was in Egypt at a scuba vacation. So I had this really good feeling when I was sitting at the beach and I was so exhausted from scuba diving and just I didn't want to do anything other than just relax on the beach. I took that feeling and made it into a 3D space and it seems to have translated. When people come in there that have never even seen the ocean, they report having kind of the same feeling as I was trying to convey and I think that's important. That's the power of VR. It's extremely immersive and people have called it like an empathy engine. And I think I agree with that. I think it can be used both for good and, and ill. So for those of you who haven't tried VR, you should try it just to see how immersive it is and how powerful it is. Um, so yeah. And any one of you can probably learn how to put uh, your own weird thing into VR chat in just about a week. We did a course at Vestadals earlier this year where people who had never touched VR before, that were also students, learned how to push things to VR chat in a month. And that was um, a course that was, it wasn't like every day, so. Yeah, it's fairly easy to get into if you too want to make your own tropical island. Of course, I have some years of art experience, but there's asset packs and stuff that you can buy because you earn more than me, all you software people. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also be anything you want, which is uh, super cool and also a little bit scary, but super cool. So these are my avatars. Um, the fish person was the first one I made. That's why this is a multidisciplinary fish person. Uh, and then I made a little lizard person and I made a shark that's attached to my hand and the rest of me is invisible. So they think it's my head and then I flip it upside down and it's funny because they think I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this isn't just uh, joking because how they set this up is that um, the avatar has eye tracking so it'll lock eyes with the next avatar that's that you're looking at. It has lip sync, so it'll analyze your voice and translate it to animation on the avatar, and all of your hands, hand movements al almost uh, gets translated into the game. So you have the basics of human conversation in virtual reality, which is super cool, because it creates a baseline experience for everyone, since everyone has talked to another human before. We all experience the same level of intimacy when we do it. Um, it's super nice, and I've actually met several people that I first met in VR, and in real life and their personalities were the same. Like I invited a couple of them to a conference and I knew they wouldn't mess up because they, they're calm people in VR and they're calm people in real life. So you kind of, you get to know people in a way that I think no other digital media can do yet. It's very cool. And then you can use these avatar changes to change how you feel a little bit. Like if I feel silly, I will change to the shark and I will have a silly voice, a silly shark voice, and it's super, super fun. Um, so you can use these digital changes of your body to change your own mood, which is what they, what, what drugs do. So <laughs> it's, pretty <laughs> it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and uh, this last secret is how to defeat your fear of public speaking, because this is actually footage, footage of a footage of a talk I had <laughs> where I was fish person and I had all of my slides inside of uh, VR and I was holding my talk like that 
which is really nice because you don't have to look at the audience because you're in VR. <laughs> um, it's not like that I don't like looking at you. I like looking at you now because I defeated my fear of public speaking by doing it in VR first. So it helped. Um, uh, so yeah, this is what the audience sees, which is pretty cool. I can actually also see the audience inside VR if I choose to. There's methods to do that, but they're, they're a little bit convoluted right now. So basically what I'm doing is inventing a new way of having talks. It, and it works really well, actually, super, super fun. So what the audience sees is this, and what I see is this. <laughs> <laughs> so I seem really competent, and I can just read up a cheat sheet, and nobody can see it, not even my cameraman. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, that was very cool. I've had that several times now. I could have had this in VR, but there was no time, so I didn't do that. Uh, we have four minutes and 20 seconds left. So I made a ask me things slide deliberately with weird images so that you would have a reason to ask me things. Please ask me things. <laughs> we have four minutes. Because I, I didn't know what the audience would consist of, so um, yeah. The Onion person is my first avatar that was optimized for the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest is a really cool VR headset that's basically a phone on your face, but it's not actually a phone that you put on your face like the Samsung Gear VR. It's um, fully optimized for what we call six DOF VR, which is six degrees of freedom, which means that you can move your head into the space and not just around in the space. So it creates a new extra level of immersion. Um, but it's still a phone and it still has the um, the strength of a phone, so it can't render as good as PC VR can, which means I had to decide um, on an on an avatar uh, design that would fit the hardware specifications, and that's how Onion Person was born. First, it was a shroom person, but people keep lick licking the shroom, and I thought it was kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually I made a whole shroom person without thinking about that, and then I got into VR, and people were like, "Oh, yum yum, I'm getting high." And I'm, no, no, so. <laughs> Uh, instead, <laughs> I actually changed it to an onion person. I remade the entire avatar so that I could say, if you cut me, you will cry. <laughs> so <laughs> so get, get away from me. Uh, so that's the story of onion person. The shark burrito was the close second choice. What is the bottom right one? Uh, the bottom right one is my spooky Halloween avatar. Um, you can't see it as well, but that's, uh, that's okay because it's very spooky. It was actually as spooky in VR that I was going to enter it for an avatar contest for Halloween, for spooky avatars, but I decided against it because people got legitimately freak out, freaked out when I wore it in VR. They got so scared I didn't want to give that to everyone because I tend to not want to bother people if they're truly uncomfortable. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so the avatar that was so scary it couldn't be publicly released. <laughs> And then I made the, the shame lady from Game of Thrones so I could go around shaming people who behave <laughs> badly. <laughs> the, the anime containment facility. This is just, this is just VR chat bullshit, okay? <laughs> uh, the anime containment facility was a, an avatar experiment when I realized you could put shares on your avatars. So it's actually another person sitting inside of the robot and I am the robot. And I can run away with the person. like they They're stuck in there until they to get up, so I trick all the anime people into sitting inside the anime containment facility and it has padded walls and some graffiti in there and they apparently they say it's not quite nice, so sometimes they don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a question down there. I never actually played Second Life, but um, I do think VR has a degree of um, empathy that you share with the people around you that you don't get on things that are just screen-based. So I think that's the biggest difference, that VR is being utilized in a really good way here. Uh, even though if you if you log in tonight, you're probably just going to see a bunch of teens yelling. Uh, but I do think we can use this technology for good. So one of my pet projects, my crafting projects, is a scene that's designed specifically for women to have gatherings in VR because there aren't that many of us and uh, we need to take care of the ones who are in there so because uh, if not I mean the guys are just gonna take this technology and run with it you know we need to take it also <laughs> yep 
Uh, I'm actually working with social VR avatars right now, so that's why I know so much about it. Um, I work as a, I guess, consultant on VR chat stuff for an avatar creation company in the States. So I'm working freelance right now. Ah, haha, we spent all the time. Yay, go us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>